So I'm going to start talking today um, about an evening-length three-act ensemble performance art piece uh, called Examples of Excess that I wrote and first participated in back in 2006, and which has been performed in a number of versions a number of times since, most recently in 2016. In particular, I'll be talking about some of the issues of artistic process that I think resonate um, with the subject matter of the final production and will hopefully also prove relevant for things that I will then discuss uh, later in the presentation. After that, we're going to watch, as I said, like 20 minutes of the piece, we'll open it up, and then finally I'm going to turn towards um, some questions of practice research. So you can, uh, if you're like me and get uh, very anxious in talks about how to plan your time and your <laughs> discomfort and when that glass of acidic institutional white wine is coming your way, you now have a kind of clear idea about that kind of thing. Um, the most recent yeah. press release um, for the piece is this kind of rather unwieldy text. Uh, from October tw 2016, and it's a relatively good um, description of the piece with all the problems and sort of hyperbole and ridiculousness that press releases always have. Uh, but I'll read it anyway to give you some kind of uh, sense of orientation. Both tragic and comic at the same time, Example of, of Excess explores the excesses, emotional, political, sexual, that haunt the fringes of our seemingly normal day-to-day -day professional activities. Although the piece was not composed with any pol particular political agenda in mind, it is nevertheless pervaded by a sense of the extraordinary, extraordinary instability of the world we now inhabit and the resultant fragility of the professional roles to which we must therefore strive to conform. Its drama is a seemingly quite mundane affair in which, before an onstage audience, an academic music historian is introduced, gives a lecture, and then answers some questions, not unlike what we're doing here today. Uh, but every moment, excessive emotions, ranging from fury and euphoria to profound despair, explode into its framework. The result is an accumulating sequence of disturbing and perhaps hilarious crises in which even the distinction between the lecturer and the music he is supposedly discussing start to collapse. Like a kid in a candy store, the piece voraciously consumes all and any available performance gestures or cliches, so that at its conclusion, all that is left is the pleasures that have been gained from the excesses of the performance itself. And perhaps in the world we presently live in, that is the only conclusion to be drawn. I'm going to be showing just a number of uh, stills from the piece as I talk, just to give you something to look at. Um, they're, they're pieces that are, because as you probably know, it's quite difficult to download stuff um, off of DVDs and stuff these days, or the material that used to be available, it's like all of a sudden doesn't work on your computer because they're nervous about copyright. Um, so I had to strangely take photographs of this in the dark of my bedroom in my parents' house, which was a very weird feeling, as if I was watching porn, but porn of myself, and my mother knocking on the door saying, what are you doing in there, Jamie? But I'm taking pictures of myself. Um, but, you know, so it has this kind of slightly kind of weird quality, but um, it gives a sense of a kind of mild melodrama and hysteria of the piece. Uh, the piece emerged initially from an invitation way back in 2006 from a group of graduate student composers in the Department of Music in the University of Buffalo, where I had worked for the past 14 years. These composers had formed an improvisation group, um, not unusual for graduate composers, called the Open Music Ensemble, specialising in the realisation of graphic scores. Since I had a reputation, or have a reputation, for being a somewhat dramatic and in some people's minds risque music history lecturer, which I basically think means that I sometimes swear when I'm lecturing, but that's you know, what risque I guess, means in Trump's America. Um, the ensemble had asked if I might not collaborate with them in crafting a talk if so desired by me, performative, to be read at one of their concerts. Uh, there was some suggestion that by producing an alternative lecture format, I would somehow be working in a manner analogous to their own practice, but that was certainly not an absolute requirement, and apart from that, the rest was left wide open. After all, and to repeat, the group, no longer in existence, was called the Open Music Ensemble. This open-endedness I found mildly frustrating. Um, since I am, as I will elaborate upon later maybe, uh, someone who likes the imposition of restrictions to get me going both intellectually and artistically. So that's the kind of the way in which my mind works in both aspects of my um, uh, practice. Um, and my feeling in this instance was that even though some of the students were good friends and in some instances even older than me, and with far more adult responsibilities at that time, uh, the, fact, um, the fact that, according to payroll, I was nevertheless the professor and they were the students meant that they felt they had ultimately to be respectful of the distinction and so not be too confident with the making of specific requests and demands. Looking back on it, this now strikes me as oddly prophetic, since the piece I ended up writing is preoccupied with the idea of established power relations and their undermining um, 
of the desire to be in control and how it can be swiftly and ruthlessly negated, and of a generalised putting into dramatic practice of an unstable and highly volatile world of masters and slaves. At the time, however, um, I had thought that the fact that I had written such a violently dialectical piece from it was simply, and I, that's talcum powder that I'm pouring on my head and I kind of strip down to um, half my prize, um, was simply an unintended yet touching testament to the fascination that post-war French absurdist drama had held for me in my teenage years when I did a lot of acting. Um, in particular, once examples of excess was complete, I noted a strong presence of other things, such as the Ionesco of the Ball Prima Donna, if you know that play, it's an extraordinary play. Um, and also a figure who's been actually important to me as a, as a researcher, uh, Genet, um, Genet's play, famous play Le Bon, um, The Maids. Examples of excess also <coughs> had a very prominent part for audio cassette recordings. Um, of my own voice that are played back live on stage using very, very rubbish technology. So the kind of stuff that, you know, you get the worst cassette player that you can find in Argos and then you put that on stage and then put a, a microphone next to it, which creates such a kind of an interestingly um, unpleasant effect um, that I was after. Some people said that that reminded them of Crap's Last Tape uh, by Beckett and personally it had nothing to do with that, but um, it's interesting what people uh, project onto these things. Work on the piece did not proceed well. Um, and I felt increasingly trapped within the commission. Um, as is often the case in this such situation, self-consciousness was the problem, and the more self-conscious I became of this fact that things weren't going as I might have liked, the worse things got. Convoluted, pretentious, lacking effective rhythm, garbled, ghastly, awful, a testament to the fact that maybe as an artist I was on some level simply aesthetically bankrupt in this instance. Or, as I increasingly came to feel, just too academic. Indeed, although in theory I've always liked the idea of the alternative lecture format, in reality, often when I've seen others fling themselves at it, or when I've tried to write one as part of an intention, I have been profoundly dissatisfied. Um, if you're interested, there's a particularly bad, very long performance lecture that I gave at the University of Chicago at the Center for Contemporary Theory, which was kind of a disaster because I was invited by no less person than Lauren Ballant to come and do this, and frankly, I think I flunked it because I thought it was ghastly. But, um, so there you go. Um, these things um, go in very, very different kinds of ways. In fact, it seems, looking back over the history of my relatively numerous attempts to re-engage conceptually and performatively, performatively with the genre of the lecture, and I've done this a number of times in performance art pieces that I've done, um, that the problem has frequently come, to, uh, come from me being made incredibly self-conscious by the directness of the demand that has instigated as a lecture's production. That was certainly the case um, with the University of Chicago. And I'm talking about this because it's actually, um, actually quite important for what happens in the piece. So it seemed to me that if you asked me to give a straight lecture, I would then immediately find myself liberated into a performative suggestions, and you asked me to give a performative lecture, and I find myself stiff as a board, like bad drag, and not even like good bad drag. And if you like drag, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, in many ways, this inability to comfortably inhabit a location that has been ordained for a particular act is one of the things that is meant by the word excess in examples of excess. So the piece on that level inhabits what used to be referred to back in the day as experiences befitting the borderline personality disorder. Uh, on the more pragmatic level of completing the piece, however, self-consciousness seemed to have become an important problem, one which it may be worthwhile to think about just for a short moment of theorisation. Not like, uh, not unlike other performers, I am someone who, in my off-stage life, though not necessarily shy, nevertheless can suffer from very high degrees of personal self-consciousness that can at times be considerably debilitating. And I think that, you know, as an aside, this is probably exacerbated in my case uh, by the fact of, of me being a gay man of a particular generation and of a particular class problematic, particularly in terms of my education background. Um, as a result, I have speculated as to whether, in fact, when self-conscious people become performers, which they not infrequently do, that they are acting intuitively out of a certain kind of dialectical savvy, increasing the source of anxiety to such a degree that, in the end, the only place that feels safe for them to be is precisely right there on stage, in a place that is so at the mercy of the gaze of others that you are then oddly liberated by it. And the audience, if the performance works, become at the mercy of you, the performer. 
So there is an element in my own personal conception of performance, and it is a personal conception, I'm not writing a book about this or trying to copyright a theory here. Um, so there's an element in my notion of conception of, of performance as a kind of revenge tragedy, or rather a revenge tragic comedy. Um, and as a result, my notion of what constitutes audience performer relations has little of the happy dialogic or pseudo-democratic qualities of interchange that became the pro forma script for talking about such things in the postmodern academy, starting sometime in the 1990s. But just because I retain a perhaps unfashionable um, and distinctly non-relational interest in upholding an almost ritualistic distinction between onstage and offstage, this does not preclude the possibility of therapeutic benefits and of something, for want of a better word, that is therefore happy. And so I've wondered if this turn to the stage by those suffering from self-consciousness might not constitute a kind of homeopathic prescription, right? <laughs> Fighting like with like, curing anxiety through an overdose of its poison. And indeed, this homeopathic prescription is one of the things that might help us to understand what is meant by the headline of my talk's title, Kill Yourself. After all, Crippling self-consciousness presents one with a horrid paradox. Not that you have lost a sense of yourself, but rather that a particularly clear vision of yourself is so utterly and oppressively proximate that there is now no room for you in relationship to it, and as a result, you feel as if you are being murdered by something of yourself. Right? It is a kind of suicide, and yet one that is void of suicide's perhaps only potentially redeeming feature, which is that at least the darkest of acts arises from a tiny light called agency. Self-consciousness thus often leads to shame, a kind of claustrophobia of the self, and this can make one realise the odd fact that being yourself in fact necessitates an imminent self relation, which in turn necessitates a certain distance in relationship to oneself. In the self-consciousness of shame, the way out of the fact that you are essentially killing yourself, and yet without your own consent note, therefore lies in the attempt to get away from this self-image by which you are slowly being elided and so suffocated out of existence. <coughs> and performance by taking sometimes terrifying risk of taking to the stage and turning oneself into an image for the conscious decision to do so, rather than um, being turned into that image by forces beyond one's control, that is, might therefore be thought of as a productive piece of tricksterism by which notoriously punitive aspects of the human psyche, such as the superego, and internalised forms of social violence, such as racism, homophobia, sexism, etc., can for a moment be sometimes circumvented. This being the case, I wondered, <laughs> I particularly like that one, <laughs> um, I wondered if the same homeopathic logic might not be applied to my own predicament in writing examples of excess. So there's a theory about self-consciousness which we can come back to, <coughs> which is interesting for the piece, and then a readaptation to it, to something which I'm sure most of us find, that we get caught with a piece and then we become increasingly self-conscious about it. Sort of the hell of the piece, like, why did I ever decide to do anything creative or anything? You know, like, there's a cubicle waiting for me, I could be working in a bank, you know, surely it'd be easier to go home at the end of the day, etc., etc., etc. As I said, I was feeling trapped in the commission, and basically that had arisen from my self-consciousness of my own inability to negotiate conflicting agendas, right? On the one hand, I felt I needed to write a lecture that was performative enough to show that I was just way too hip just to be an academic, a version of the I'm too sexy for my job um, aspiration, <laughs> right? And yet, on the other hand, I wanted it to be not so performative that you weren't still dazzled by the realisation that I was smart enough to be an academic anyway. Um, as with many forms of self-consciousness, my predicament in this in instance was underwritten by my own narcissistic fantasies. And indeed, because of Examples of Excess is a piece that deals, for a kind of surreal mimesis, with academic life itself, 
And since academia is, for an infinitely complex set of reasons, a place where incendiary shortcuts between narcissism and self-consciousness are far from unusual, <laughs> it is surprising then that the relationship between narcissism and, uh, which is unsurprising, sorry, that the relationship between narcissism and self-consciousness became a major theme of this piece. So there was on a certain level a strongly interwoven relationship between the formal proclivities of the artistic process of the piece's writing and the subsequent content of the final piece itself. And there's a horribly kind of involuted uh, quality to the piece which, which I think in a certain sense gives it its energy um, and makes it on a certain level funny but also slightly repulsive. As a result, I kept all the ingredients that were causing my discomfort, since nothing, after all, lights the fuse of one's own creative anxieties more than the attempt to escape what is causing them. However, what I did do was to reconfigure the relationship of these ingredients to each other. The result was no longer a lecture to be performed at a graphic score improvisation concert, nor even a performative lecture for such a performance. Rather, what now started pouring out of me was a fully-fledged performance in and of itself, in places, in fact, almost a traditional drama that took as its subject matter the very problem I was presently embroiled within. So, as already stated, examples of excess is loosely constructed around an academic giving a lecture. However, instead of the academic's problem being the one I was suffering from, of how to give a performative lecture, the problem that came to be represented was more what happens when one develops an inability to perform the necessary requirements that enable you to convince people in a professional situation that you are merely just giving a lecture. So it's about the framing of professional anxieties. In this instance, the musicians who had asked me to just do something to accompany them were no longer doing something separate from myself, but were now part of this performance about the professional performance of a lecture. They now had to submit to my own not inconsiderable demands, both through the quite fanatically detailed stage directions and through the fact that I decided that I would both perform in the piece and direct it, but also that they would now not only have to man engage in musical improvisation, but other times would simply have to act and as you know, like sometimes uh, contemporary music performers love to act, and sometimes they hate you um, if you say, can you make a sound or do something which is, is beyond doing it. So it's an interesting uh, problem, um, and not the, the social dynamics of, it, that, of that is always kind of fascinating to me. It was honestly, as far as I knew at the time, all in inverted. Nevertheless, looking back on it, I cannot but help notice the excruciating and yet not unhilarious irony of what ended up happening which is that a bunch of straight, they're all straight in that performance, male improvisers and white, straight male white improvisers, invite me, in other words, something of a flamer, right, to, as it were, come out of my shell a bit, in response to which said person, flamer, myself, then takes control of the whole thing, completely contravening the democratic aspirations of improvised music making, and then having done so, massively delimits the possibility for improvisation by making the music musicians then submit to what is essentially a highly detailed score. One, moreover, in which the larger proportion of the time they are not even performing music at all. Indeed, the second time the full version of Examples of Excess was performed, it was once more also by a well-known Buffalo improvisation group called Wooden Cities. And without wishing to blow my own horn too much, um, there's plenty of very mediocre things that I've been associated and produced in my life. The results in each instance were oddly intense and quite thrilling. It was as if by negating fundamental precepts of improvisatory practice, we all nevertheless managed to create precisely the effective intensification that many improvisers, myself included, often seek. It is perhaps Hegel 101, nevertheless. Perhaps what this experiment seemed to suggest was that in certain situations, what is ultimately needed for a group of improvisers most effectively to unleash their full potential is that they follow a very tightly scripted text. Um, so I want to play now um, act two uh, of the piece. So the piece is in three acts. Act one is perhaps the most surreal and um, experimental. I don't think there's anything incendiary on there apart from the disappearing German romanticism like into the woods. Um, act one is perhaps the most experimental of the pieces. It's in which the musicians are on stage, but they're not acting with me, but they're acting as if they're a rather sinister bunch of onlookers. 
and they are in fact performing music. They have to improvise certain kinds of um, atmospheric sounds and stuff like that. I come on and then introduce myself, seemingly to nobody, right? So it becomes instead of the the standard introduction, you know, he's written a very important book, you know, music and the politics of negation, you know, war, you know, it's because it becomes this kind of like <laughs> that was me doing that. Not you doing that. Um, it becomes this kind of obscene <laughs> confessional in which the, the musicologist, because he's meant to be a music uh, historian, confesses that, in fact, the reason he studies uh, music history, I mean, it's kind of an old joke, really, but I mean, it's a good one, um, is for sadomasochistic reasons of sort of tying up bits of music and dressing them up as frat boys, that's one of the jokes, and that, and sort of buggering them hermeneutically senseless. And, you know, I mean, it's all kind of like a little bit slapstick, but, you know, you get the idea. So he confesses that he's done this, and then he confesses a moment where he reports that the music actually ans uh, answered him back and said something back, and said, I love you. And the music historian confesses, I love you too. And then the piece of music says, but because of that, you now have to try and imitate me. And the imitation of me involves me taking most of my clothes off, covering myself in a bucket of talcum powder, and then improvising to a very sinister monologue in my voice about what music is saying about me. Um, and most of the things it's saying about me are, are kind of brutal and um, depressing and you know all the kind of anxieties that we try to kind of keep at bay when we're being a musicologist and get up on stage at the Royal Musical Association. Or whatever. Um, is, does this, uh, just do, okay, great. Um, act two is the most traditional theatrical, and I'm gonna play it because it, it, it also has kind of the best sound. I mean, as you know, like the question of, uh, uh, getting videos and stuff of this stuff is tricky and a number of times it hasn't worked and the sound doesn't work. Oh, okay. um, it's basically what we're doing now. A group of people come in, somebody introduces her, I, I'm going to give a lecture. But everything in it then devolves and once more we end with this situation of the tape recorder just saying these just utterly devastating things. This time directly to the audience. So in each situation there's something normal. And I'm kind of interested artistically on the idea of something that just keeps kind of quite invariant, right? Which you can kind of use as a means of going a very long way away and then kind of like sucking yourself back in. So it's a little bit like the sort of Berio uh, Mahler movement of the symphonia, right? You've got the con continuity of the line and yet you can go off into, you know, fragments of La Mer and, you know, bits of Levi-Strauss and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but then kind of keep sucking in. So that movement of sort of containment and then sort of dispersal um, and then kind of coming back is the thing that I kind of like, like so much, right? And the idea of examples of excess is, of course, based on the joke, which used to be kind of hilarious back in the day, which, you know, somebody would be giving this sort of that deathly lecture about whatever they're giving, and then they'd have their little cassette recorder, and they'd kind of like miserably then walk over to the stereo, you know, like Marie Antoinette going to the guillotine, and stick the thing in and then place it, and you get this awful kind of like incredibly <coughs> sort of... I I I emaciated version of this kind of massive thing that they've been talking about historically or whatever. So it's, it's an inversion of that where the example um, actually becomes hugely excessive in relationship to the hermeneutic frame um, which is, which is um, surrounding it. Any questions or comments at this stage? We all feel very self conscious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's one of the, um, the, the nasty things about the piece. I mean, it's quite a nasty thing in a certain way. It's quite manipulative, right? <laughs> Um, it's full of gags, right? I mean, so, and, and kind of cheap gags in a certain kind of way, right? Um, and uh, they feel so uncomfortable that I have to move. Um, <laughs> um, and then, of course, it kind of provides this kind of weird means of sort of then turning the whole thing around and then opening it up. So it's not even just like the audience initially performing being an audience is there, then it sort of opens up in, in this kind of obscene way. Um, just a sort of a weird sort of thing about background, I mean, because in the, the title of the talk, um, I sort of said that, you know, it's about professional death. I actually put this piece together in the year that I went up to ten for tenure. And I hadn't actually thought about the repercussions of that enough. I mean, I can be painfully neurotic and kind of like, you know, like, 
worrying about the gas stove being on all the time. But then in other instances, there was a sort of strange instance that they got caught into, <clears throat> I mean, I guess what, you know, the psychoanalysts would call it sublimation. You know, you're, just, you're in the zone, right? You're writing it, you're doing it, and I, I'm working with the people. You're thinking about very mundane little things, right? Now, how are we going to do with the tape recorder? You know, like, where are we going to place it? Can you move on there? You know, like, can, can we use talcum powder? Is there a fire restriction about that? You know, like, well, no, there isn't, but it, it turns out it's carcinogenic. Well, we'll just have to deal with that. You know, like, I mean, you know, so it's all those kind of things going on. And it was only just when I was about to go on stage that somebody said, half your faculty is here. <laughs> I mean, you know, and the American tenure process is not a nice thing, right? And I just simply hadn't thought of it until I went on stage. So there was this kind of strange intensity to this performance, which was just like, well, then I just simply had to make the best of it because it might be the last chance I have to work with these people because they might just chuck me out. And there's this very weird moment where a colleague of mine, who's, I, I get along with him perfectly nice, but he's a tricky colleague and uh, elder and blah, 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 sort of slightly hemorrhoidal and stuff, came up to me in tears after the piece because of the ending of, of, of Act Two. So there was, it had this very unintentional um, sort of strange communal effect on, on what, what went on. And I actually think that, weirdly enough, the reason my tenure process went through fine, and not just because I had stuff and I taught all right and I hadn't done anything like totally disgusting, right? Um, was something to do with this, that it actually made some kind of strange space um, where my colleagues didn't have to sort of, you know, who's this strange sort of slightly flamboyant gay guy that who does all this stuff about musical philosophy and seems a little bit, you know, like, is he smart or is it just a joke or, you know, like, whatever. Um, strangely actually opened up a kind of a weird space for me. So there's a kind of, a, there's an oddness about the piece um, itself. It's also interesting in a kind of a dialectical sense that I've shown this act because this is, of course, the act where the musicians do least. <laughs> so they really are just forced in that situation to do it. And in the rehearsals, they've been kind of like a little rubbish, you know, because they didn't really want to do it. And then there was something about the performance that, I mean, they're kind of superb, right? I mean, in many senses, sort of better than I was acting was the way in which they were acting, particularly the bit where they're running in, on and off stage, you know, going off and, off and doing all this kind of thing. So, so there was a weirdness to um, the nature of the thing that, uh, about whether it in, uh, creates the possibility of commentary or whether it's just sort of like it just kind of shuts you up um, in a certain way, which I think is kind of interesting. But, um, I can carry on or I can, um, are there any questions after that little thing? Yes. Um, <coughs> do you think that would, would come across differently to a, an American audience or a US audience than it would to, to a UK audience? Partly just because of the material itself, but partly because it was being delivered by a British voice? Maybe. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've done performance stuff here. Usually when I do performance stuff here, people find it sinister. Right? Um, whereas in the States, they find it slapstick and then realize that it's sinister. Right. So that's, that, that's one of the things uh, uh, that, that goes on. Um, and definitely there's a sort of a, a certain way in which the comedy is worked, which is for an American audience. Um, sort of gags, right? Um, which I don't mean patronising, I like gags, um, and that's why I wrote it, so I didn't write anything that I didn't want to. Um, but there is a kind of a sort of a sense of that. I mean, you all look quite serious, and it's kind of interesting. I've, I've been to other places, and it's just like, you know, they're kind of like, they're either kind of like rivals or whatever. Um, you know, so there's, there is that question. Um, it is, it goes very wildly in different directions, um, depending on who's watching it, um, um, and in what location. And is there much of a tradition in the US of that sort of bouffant thing of, of dragging the audience into a dark place? As well? I mean, on a certain level, there's just a tradition of that in performance, <coughs> right? Um, about breaking, you know, I mean, which is always presented as a pot. I mean, usually in the books, it's presented the positive thing, right? And then we got rid of the distinction between on stage and off stage, and we're all liberated to kind of, you know, roll around on the floor with each other. Um, in this way. So there's a tradition of that. Um, there's a tradition of that in the location um, that's performed, because it's performed in hall walls, right? Um, and hall walls in the States, anyway, is, uh, historically speaking, a very important contemporary arts centre. Um, as I said, with Cindy Sherman began, Robert Longo, uh, uh, Tony Conrad was there a lot. You know, so it has this kind of uh, uh, prevalence for um, an avant-garde kind of gesture. Um, I like the idea of an avant-garde breaking down of boundaries between on stage and off stage, precisely because it allows 
for a basic feature of comedy, right? And, and, and essentially, it's more comic than serious, this piece, right? Um, the comedy is there to frame the making of serious statements. Um, but I like that because you can then sort of play with that kind of thing, but then also leave people kind of like sort of quite uncomfortable um, about, uh, about where you're left, right? So, the, I mean, there isn't an intention, um, but it is nevertheless that the sense of not being, and not in kind of like some meta, you know, I'm being metacritical or metatheatrical, just like in a literal sense, you're not quite sure where to place yourself, right? Um, so is that funny or is that just kind of embarrassing? Is that too much of him? Right, so there's an e absolute element of narcissism involved, right? You know, look at me for a very long time, being me, right? Um, which, which comes into play um, with it. So there's a sense of like, um, when I was putting it together, of um, definitely, um, wanting to draw on those gestures, because I like the gestures. I mean, I like theatre, and whether we like it or not, theatre involves gestures, the framing of them, um, of bodies in tableaus and stuff like that. So I like those kinds of movements. I like the, I mean, you know, it gives the, the chance to be able to, to make images like that, right? Which I like as an image, um, the way in which it's kind of framed um, in this way. Um, so there is a sort of a sense that it allows for these kind of um, hanging these things on a certain kind of washing line um, and then allowing them to nevertheless have a very, very basic narrative plot, um, which, is the, uh, which is almost turned into a mythology, which is like introduction, give a lecture, answer question and answers. Right? Um, and, and then it's kind of over um, in that way. Uh, but from the perspective of what it was like with the musician, well, the interesting thing was just like make, not making them, they decided to, they didn't have to. Um, to do something which was, you know, not what they usually do at all. So that was the sort of part of it was about creating that kind of intensity. And I found that when I've worked with normally theatrical people, it doesn't work as well. So oddly, when I work with improvised music improvisers, I, it, it creates a certain kind of tension um, which allows for something to happen, um, which I find kind of interesting. Um, on that you keep referring to it as as humorous, but I find it incredibly tragic, actually. Mm. Uh, and candid, and mm. like you're very self-aware of the problems of academia or teaching in general. With that power. I've just seen the second movement, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, I'm not surprised one of your colleagues came crying to me. Like it was, it, it's quite brutal, actually. Mm. And um, so I wonder why you keep referring to it as as uh, full of gags and joke when I find it the gags and joke are just there to highlight, a bit like in Shakespeare's. Mm. <laughs> To take a small comparison, uh, uh, the jokes are just there to make it. I like the comparison. Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> uh, I've got that list filled again. <laughs> or kind of like David Foster Wallace meets uh, meets Shakespeare. You know, kind of self-referential. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but there is this. The, the humor is just there to make the the the, the, the abysmal candor kind of, uh, yeah. more depressive to. Maybe because I'm an academic middle-aged crisis, I don't know. It just no, 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 no. No, I like the comment. I mean, I'm not... Um, w with regard to my own work, I kind of... I, there's a reason why I would never... Uh, I'd make a terrible parent, because once I've given birth to it, it can go and defend itself, as far as I'm concerned. You know, like, um, although I like talking about it, and it's, it's a piece that I like performing in. It's obviously very... N I mean, it's written by me, for me, uh, in a way. Um, it's an interesting question, though, because... Um, one of the other things that I do is write poetry and write librettos, which are almost consistently of a very, very serious um, nature. In fact, sort of a move towards a kind of sort of lyric high modernism in terms of um, the way in which I do things. Um, but I've often, I, I've thought for a long time about the difficulty. I mean, it's, a, it's actually a, a problem that becomes increasingly problematic during the course of the 20th century um, as we go on. And I'm not sure where we are with it now because the question of comedy versus tragedy is kind of moving around in very complicated ways at the moment. Um, but it's the problem of you want to say something serious and how do you do it? Do you just go directly for it? Um, I, in a certain sense, I kind of feel that one of the things that comes up again and again with... Um, the artistic stuff and when I was talking about self-consciousness and stuff is that not being able to get at something by a direct route, right? So I like the idea of what you're saying because I remember saying at the time when I wrote it that the comedy in a certain sense 
is there so that you can have a frame for saying something else. Whereas if you just said it, it wouldn't work. Mm. Right? So there's something about, I guess, what's interesting to me about a movement uh, between emotional modes and about that transition into something so that it can, in fact, be serious. Now, I mean, there's a broader historical question to this, right, which is about the reemergence of comedy, you know, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, as a sort of a, a, sort of a counterbalance to sort of over-German sort of seriousness, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you kind of move in on this way. But if we go back to one of the sources of, of one of those, you know, desires for a comic laughter, et cetera, et cetera, which would be Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. uh, go back to something like um, Thus Broke Zarathustra, um, text, that text in particular, he says, you know, you must be able to laugh, and it seems like levity. Um, but his point is, it's just like, actually, you have to be able to laugh because that's how you do something serious, right? So there's a question of the problem of serious expression as it develops during the course of, of, of the 20th century, which I think on a certain level, because I started off um, as a new music person, in fact, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and then moved back to studying high modernism, and then ended up writing a PhD about Mozart, for which nobody would think that that's what I did anymore. But um, so I did. I was very much thinking about those kinds of things. There's also a sort of a personal thing which might be um, it, it's either relevant or not irrelevant. I mean, I'm not not kind of quite sure. Um, which is that I think self consciousness produces a proclivity sometimes towards the comic because it's very difficult to be able to to make the you know you, you don't think somebody's going to take you seriously. So there is, although it's not necessary, I think, to know this in order to, to listen to the piece, to watch the piece. There is a certain kind of ambush in place, right? You know, that I'm kind of giving you, you know, these kind of like nice easy tidbits about jokes about, you know, musicology being more abundant or whatever, which I actually don't believe, um, to be quite honest. Um, but it's, you know, it's good jokes, blah, 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 you know, do all that kind of stuff. And then that allows for them this sort of other thing to sort of emerge out of it, and then you're kind of caught. So it's, it's sort of a little bit like giving somebody what they want, um, oh, you're a funny gay guy. Right? I mean, there's a problem that uh, people in, in certain problematic political and marginalized positions often find themselves in, actually. Um, and then using that as a means of sort of getting something else. So, so it's nice that you pick up on that because, in fact, I haven't thought about that for a long time. But it is, in fact, why I like comedy, precisely because it allows something serious to be said in a way that you just don't feel sort of appalled by the heart on the sleeve quality mm -hmm. of it, right? Um, about, oh, God, I'm being, like, really serious and whatever. And not because I don't like seriousness, but because seriousness, you know, we, we all know that it, 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 it's become so, it easily becomes so easily performative, right? Mm. Whereas comedy is already, I'm performing. Like mm. Comedy is about types. It's not about characters. It's about, you know, stock figures, et cetera, et cetera. The lecturer, that's all you know, basically, you know, going on in this thing. Um, but then that allows, then, a space so that when something comes out, it can have that quality. Then the question, of course, is where is that coming from? Because right, it's my voice, but it's meant to be my voice as the voice of music, right? You know, and then there's a, you know, and so there's this kind of confusion on that level, um, which is part of just simply what I like theatrically. Mm. I like things that sort of fall apart, um, but but, but re re retain their cohesiveness um, in that way. I did actually feel that weirdly, um, one of the things which was a correlation between. I mean, I've never really done much work about looking at the literature on practice research because I'm not a practice researcher. I've done practice, I do this, and then I go off and do musicology, and I don't think about actually musicology like I do here. It's just like musicology is just some material, mm -hmm. just sort of objective heft of stuff that I can use to make shapes and produce affects that I find I would probably want to watch. So that's kind of what goes on. Um, but one of the things that I note, and maybe, maybe you can just sort of help me with this, maybe this is a good way to sort of move it, move it out and onwards and sort of farewell or whatever, um, is, is the part of the problem for me about practice research um, is, is that it goes back to this issue which I was talking about in my first little lecture, which is the question of self-consciousness. So often you find in I have a, I have one, here's one I made earlier, so I used to send with Peter. Oh, here, by the way, is a very famous painting in the Albright Knox Museum called Kill Yourself. 
Um, and in fact, the title came because I'd spoken with Robert and we were going to you know, do this thing. And then I was thinking about this, you know, what am I going to do about it? And I was in the museum and then they had this sort of extraordinary event just says, kill yourself. You know? And I was just like, there's something about, obviously, the performance, which is about you know, professionally kind of killing yourself. But also this question of self-consciousness, where I'm interested in, like, you kind of kill something else off in you. I mean, this is just my experience as an artist, not a theory. It's, a, it's, it's, it's empirical, if you like. Um, you kill something off in you in order to get over a, a problem within the artistic process. So, so that's sort of roughly right. But here's, you know, I just, I literally, I mean, I'm not even pretend that I've like got like, you know, I've read the bibliography. I went to the Wikipedia site on practice research and this um, paper came up and I took a quotation out of it whilst I was, you know, drinking a glass of wine on a train in the States. So for practice research to be seen as valid, production of knowledge of production con constantly needs to be questioning her processes, right? This is what interested me, whilst finding a suitable way of articulating the doing and thinking that led him. Now, I started thinking about this as just like, so practice research, according to this statement, introduces the necessity of a certain kind of knowledge-based self-consciousness um, that is drawn into the process of the research. Now, self-consciousness is, this is, again, my experience as an artist, right, is, is that self-consciousness for me is the problem. It is the thing which derails me making what I consider to be practice research. I mean, to, to be you know, a, a suitable aesthetic form, basically. I have to get over that in a certain way. And it's not like kind of some kind of transcendental escapism. It's just literally a kind of a weird, it's almost like something Lacan would talk about. We're kind of shifting in relationship to the superego. You sort of trick it out of, of being so you can get on. Adorno famously said about artistic productivity, it is the ability to be voluntarily involuntary. I think is a really excellent um, way of describing how I find this process. Right? So for me, I couldn't make this practice part of practice research because my, for my practice to happen, I have to stop being self-conscious in the way that could produce knowledge in the academic form. And of course, there's a gazillion ways of thinking about knowledge. There's embodied knowledge, there's this knowledge, blah, 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 blah. Right? But we know what this means. It means producing articles. And it means producing things that can then be put on websites and then can be kind of like quoted for, um, you know, when the government comes along and decides if they're going to give you one peanut or two, right? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the year, right? So I was interested in this. Um, there's plenty of artistic practices where self-consciousness about the procedure as knowledge happens. That's fine. It's just not personally what turns me on. It's final product. That's all it is. And it's not, if they want to do it, that's fine. Go, go and do it. It's not, not an issue for me. So I was interested in this because I felt that, in a weird way, there is something said about research very clearly in examples of excess, right? I mean, very stringently, disturbingly, whatever. It came out of getting over self-consciousness. I mean, literally just like forgetting what was meant to be happening. You know how weird it is. Somebody then says, oh, this piece seems like about death or things about that. And you were actually kind of thinking about like, how am I going to go from that sonority with three clarinets to a harp and celeste with a tam-tam there? You know, you're kind of like thinking on this level and it produces something going, oh my God, that was so amazing. It said something to me that, you know, if you're lucky in your audience, like yourself, it said something to me that nobody else has ever said before. And you were kind of weirdly distracted right, sort of asleep on the job in a weird way, right, by something else, and that sneaks in, right? So all the stuff about you've wasted your life and blah, 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, over a drink in a pub at a conference, I might say, don't you think we're just all wasting our lives, kind of thing? But it's not there present to my mind. It's present to my mind because I got over self-consciousness by reshifting myself in relationship to the basic parameters of what I was working with for the commission. Right? You know, the commission to do something, I had to do it, and I took exactly what was there, but then just sort of repositioned it in that way. So I would say that on a certain level, part of my worry with practice research is, is that it will have to necessitate a certain kind of practice or a certain kind of aesthetic product or a certain kind of end goal which incorporates knowledge-based self-consciousness as part of its process. And that is fine, but it can only be a certain kind of thing. And I would say that it therefore privileges a certain kind of postmodern ish um, 
mo modalities of thinking about things, where the sort of self-consciousness of expression um, com comes to be sort of more important about it. So I just kind of wonder, I mean, it's kind of like a slightly kind of scare tactics thing, whether <coughs> the prevalence of practice research, which is great for us, right? It gets administrations off our back when they're saying, like, what are you doing? Are we going, we're doing research. And I'm not saying that there's nothing interesting about what we do. I find it, what, what artists do I find to be the most gripping thing personally that I love. I mean, I do. I just think it's an extraordinary thing. Um, but it does also buy us time, right? You know, that you can go off and, like, you know, beat, do, compose, but don't worry, it's practice, you know, sort of, and then you can be playing your bass clarinet. I think she's a clarinet player. Um, and saxophone. saxophone, that's right. Um, and you can do it. I mean, I have nothing against her, like, at all, right? You know, so this isn't a personal thing. And I, I mean, I can be quite aggressive, but that, that's another matter. Um, I just sort of wonder about what this... You know, here's a very interesting case where my sort of historical uh, tendencies, my sort of musicological research thing would be interesting. Like, in 50 years' time, if we're still here, maybe there will be books about how the institutional economic foundations of the university system in the UK, which is much more prevalent with practice research than in the States, by the way, uh, where it doesn't exist in such a strong discursive form, um, created a certain kind of compositional practice which was necessary in order to create a kind of thing. So I had some kind of typically, for me, sort of slightly hysteric uh, final couplet, which was something like this. My conclusion, oh, I read it, but <laughs> thus, is not that practice cannot constitute research, but rather that we need a certain distance, not a proximity between the two for that to happen. It's precisely because I wasn't thinking about it as practice, that if it does anything, that happened, right? Um, that we need a certain distance or sort of proximity between the two in order for that to happen. If that distance is taken away, I think we also take away one of the possible means by which we can transcend, not in a romantic sense, the problems of self-consciousness um, and thus productively kill ourselves. Right? That's, getting over self-consciousness is a killing of something in yourself. Um, and without such distances, between practice and research, I wonder if I wonder to what degree our professional successes might not just constitute a slow form of suicide.